Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. My name is Jeff Wycliffe. I'm at Tulane University School of Public Health. I'm an environmental health scientist by training, toxicologist, and risk assessor. Um, I'd like to thank Louisiana Sea Grant for inviting us to come over and talk about some of the work we've done with one of our local communities. Um, with that, uh, a little background before the spill, and this actually goes back probably 10, 15 years when I was working in Texas at the University of Texas Medical Branch. Um, as an environmental health scientist, I've always been interested in actually what happens in communities, um, primarily chemical exposures, exposure assessment. So working with communities is not entirely new to me. Um, it can be challenging. Um, but when I got to Tulane, I didn't really know the lay of the land. Uh, so I got with a colleague there in the school who was working with a group of folks out in New Orleans East, and that's the eastern part of New Orleans for those of you who um, have not ever heard of that, but that's the way they refer to it. Uh, it's primarily a Vietnamese community. Um, it was settled by Vietnamese refugees. Uh, and many of the older folks especially don't speak much English, if any. So I'll talk about that later towards the end of the talk. Um, but just to give you a feel for the sense that somebody like me doesn't just walk into a community like that and say, these are your problem, let's study them. That's just not how this works. Uh, so I was introduced to this group through one of their community organizations that was really developed after Katrina. That's the Mary Queen of Vietnam Community Development Corporation. So they really center a lot of their community efforts uh, and they're just social aspects around their church. And my goal really was to just establish a relationship, start discussions about what kind of environmental health issues I could, might help them with, what concerns they had, um, and then try to align my research capabilities and needs with some things that they might have uh, need of my help with. This is the layout of the community itself. It's in that little rectangular box. Um, that is the eastern part of New Orleans. Uh, heavily impacted after Katrina, this area flooded big time. 60% of the New Orleans landmass, 21% of the population, mostly Vietnamese, African American, and now a growing Latino presence, so it's a minority community with a host of social problems that existed both before and after Katrina. Um, Really a lack of food access brought about by Katrina. No grocery stores wanted to move back into that area or market, so these folks had a lot of trouble getting food access as well as healthcare access. A lot of the clinics in the area closed, didn't want to reopen. Not a real money-making market out there, at least the way they see it. Then in late April 2010, as we all know, the Deepwater Horizon accident comes along. I'm not going to go into details about what all that is. Everybody knows that, and Emily did a good job of reminding us of what happened. Um, but immediately, our community partner started organizing meetings, uh, many of which were organized in part with local and state and federal agencies, as well as BP officials. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and these meetings were really designed to get a feel for what the community was worried about, not surprisingly. Loss of livelihood, Most of the, about a third of the folks in the community are directly involved in the seafood industry. Um, they were worried about long-term effects of the spill on their financial stability. Uh, again, it's a pretty marginalized community, um, low income, so it doesn't take much to knock them off. Um, they're incredibly resilient, though. It was amazing how fast they came back after Katrina, mostly on their own. Uh, and then they were worried about effects on mental and physical health. And this e even relates to eating contaminated seafood. That was a major concern. A little bit of background of the 40,000 or so Vietnamese in coastal areas along Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Uh, about a third of those work in the seafood industry in some direct way. Um, I would argue that more than that are heavily impacted by what goes on in the seafood industry. There's about 15,000 Vietnamese in the New Orleans East area, so it's one of the highest concentrated groups of Vietnamese along the Gulf Coast. And Vietnamese and Southeast Asian fishermen make up about a third of all of the shrimping fleet now along the Gulf Coast. So this picture was taken, uh, this was a meeting I attended. It was organized by MQVN in part, but really dictated by uh, the responding agencies and BP officials. Sort of typical classroom style meeting with an expert panel up front. Uh, telling people what they need to know in English. Um, most of these folks don't speak English particularly well and they don't understand English particularly well and at the first couple meetings, 
they uh, didn't really set up to have very good translation services. So probably by about the third or fourth meeting I attended there might have been 10 percent of the folks in, in the room uh, in meetings organized this way. They just weren't getting information and, and the information they were trying to get back to the officials just wasn't making it. So the language barriers were a tremendous problem for this group. So we got an NSF rapid grant um, which was really interesting. It's out of the socio uh, behavioral sciences branch of the NSF and the goal there I was working with an environmental sociologist was to really study how an environmental health project can be developed with a group like this in a way that's meaningful both to the community, the citizen scientists who participate in the research itself and the academic scientists such as myself. I know that's always a big concern when working with communities. So one of the first things we did was reorganize the meetings. So the meetings were all held in Vietnamese and I wore the headset translating Vietnamese into English. Um, and it was amazing how much more dialogue, how much more discussion uh, we got out of that. I don't think it should be all that surprising. Um, but we really ended up coming up with some, some good ideas on, on how to tackle this. And the main thing was to discuss the primary issues of concern that were relevant to all the stakeholders and when I say that I include myself. There's a limited amount of expertise I bring um, which they appreciated me telling them what my limits were instead of pretending like I could be all to them for everything. And then the ultimate goal was to develop a partnering team uh, to carry some research project forward. So this is really what we decided. We decided that food safety and shrimp contamination which are areas that I can readily tackle for them were of major, con uh, major community concern and as Emily mentioned shrimp is number one by far and away in Louisiana and mostly along the Gulf Coast. Certainly other seafood types are very important too but shrimp was by far and away the biggest concern. It's mostly what they eat and, and harvest. So they were really concerned about white shrimp um, and analytical results uh, collected in white shrimp from locales that were relevant to them. So they knew there was a lot of testing going on. They didn't know where the testing was happening. They weren't sure the areas that they typically harvest shrimp in were being collected and tested. So they wanted to go out, collect their own shrimp and have those tested. Makes sense. Um, one of the other key issues was identifying an analytical lab that was seen as objective and unbiased. Uh, a lot of the analytical labs that are capable of using the GCMS technologies to look for PAHs in environmental media were also contracted, contracting with BP. They knew this. Um, just to tell you straight up, they didn't see those as very reliable laboratories to trust results from. Hard to find a lab that hadn't done something for the oil company but we agreed on a lab um, that was using the most modern technologies and methods. Um, we also needed to collect data on residents so we could perform chemical health risk assessments and the obvious thing to do was carry this all the way out through collection of samples, analyzing those, discussing the results and then any dissemination needs that the community might have. And we really left that up to them. We didn't dictate what we were going to disseminate. We let them decide what they wanted to disseminate and we would help them in any way they could. And then the last bullet there was we did ask them and, and to agree on allowing us to publish the results in peer reviewed journals and seek additional funding with that data and we all agreed that this was a fair way to go. So this is us in action. So we went out on uh, uh, one night we went out on a trawler to collect shrimp and I'll show you some of the sites where we collected those. We also went out in a skimmer to collect shrimp. In the middle there was our target white shrimp. Um, for those of you who know anything about shrimp you can see that bottom shrimp has dark gills. Um, this is a, an entirely natural process but our partners thought that that might be oil. Uh, and admittedly they said that they were looking for it more now so they weren't sure if they were just seeing it more because they were looking for it more which I thought was really interesting. Um, but we did talk about analyzing samples that were collected from gills as well. As well. So these are the sites that we collected shrimp from. This was in early November, late October. Uh, this inland site on the right side of the screen uh, is Bayou Bienvenue. This is an area where there are a lot of skimmers area was never closed, never experienced any visible oil so they felt like this area should represent some kind of background. I think that's reasonable. And then the other area is the Chandelier Sound um, where one of the folks that we worked with, a shrimper, trawls routinely. This area was closed. It opened up in October so we were able to go out in early November and collect samples from this area. So that's a little transect that we ran out in the Chandelier Sound. <coughs> 
As far as data goes, this is a representative graphical output of one of the samples. I just plucked this from all of the graphs that we have for the data to show you some results. They were all looked strikingly similar to this in that there's very little PAH material in these samples. Um, we did multiple composites of at least five shrimp from each of those sampling sites, so at the minimum of three uh, composites from each of those sites to look at any kind of variation within those sites. We looked at tail mussel because that's what they were worried about, that's what they mostly eat. Um, and then they also wanted to look at the gills to see what this material might be in gills. Um, a panel of pyrogenic and petrogenic PAHs, I don't expect you to read everything on that x axis but it's a number of pyrogenic parent compounds, benzoapyrene for example, phenanthrene, fluoranthine, pyrene and then the alkylated homologs, those are very common in crude oil. Uh, they're just alkylated forms of that parent isomer. The black line is one PPB and just to show you that how low the levels were, uh, most of our detects were at the detection limit. In fact, some of these are slightly below the detection limit. Um, and mostly what we detected were pyrogenics. We didn't detect many alkylated forms which would be sort of a signature for contamination with crude oil in any of these samples. We also needed to conduct a community analysis to generate the kind of data we needed to do a, a, a comprehensive chemical based health risk assessment. We phone interviewed 104 research participants. We did this through a research center in Washington State University. Uh, the phone interview or the survey itself was promoted by MQV and again we were very focused on this primarily group of Vietnamese in New Orleans East. We weren't so much interested in sort of translating this to US across the U.S. portable sort of health risk assessments. We really felt like these folks eat a lot of shrimp and they tend to be pretty small so they're probably the most at risk. And we focused on collecting data on s by self-report on shrimp consumption habits to develop um, um, estimates of intake rates, body weight as well. So Vietnamese in this community eat about three times as much shrimp as the 90 percentile consumer that the FDA use, so quite a bit more shrimp. And they tend to weigh about 20 kilograms less than the average U.S. citizen. So both of those together tend to drive the risk up. We used a probabilistic uh, methods for distributionalizing parameters in the average daily dose and lifetime average daily dose calculations for risk assessors in here. They'll appreciate what that is. And we estimated health risk for both non-cancer uh, non outcomes and cancer outcomes. Uh, where we looked at multiple carcinogenic PHs, we used a relative potency factor methodology. And then we continued to make a series of assumption laden estimates to sort of look at the uh, range of probabilistic health risk outcomes. Primarily we found no unacceptable health risk to parent using hazard quotients or cancer risk probabilities for any detected compounds with established toxicity. We didn't find any uh, unacceptable health risks to parent for cancer risk using MDL, so we just assigned those known carcinogens the MDL. <coughs> Found no unacceptable health risks there, so even after we combined them using an RPF approach. And the only time we saw cancer health risks becoming, quote, excessive, uh, at least by our, our estimates, are when we used MDLs for all known carcinogens combined with all of their alkylated isomers, which is really not realistically fair. Uh, but we did want to explore what that would look like, and we assigned those alkylated isomers, which we don't know much about toxicologically equal potencies to their parent compound, which again is a real, real stretch. So what did we get from this? Um, white shrimp collected from this area in early November 2010 using this pro uh, process uh, really found low levels of PAHs in tail meat. Um, no evidence of petrogenic contamination. We didn't find really any unacceptable health risks uh, with what we had detected, um, even at very high intake rates. And by empowering the communities to play an active role in this research project um, really allowed us to get into the field pretty quick. I don't have a shrimper handy. I don't really know where to go either. So I was relying on my shrimpers who are literally the experts in where shrimp are and where to collect them and how to collect them. Um, so that was a very fruitful partnership. Uh, it was also kind of neat to go out all night on a shrimper. I'd never been out on one and, and boy we ate a lot of shrimp that night. Um, and going forward, we're continuing to work with this community and it's really built a, a, a mutually beneficial and trusted relationship between us. So we're much more um, able to quickly respond to things that come up or if there are chronic problems, take a more meaningful approach to those. So these are some of the lessons we learned. Obviously language in this community is 
tricky. Uh, actually working with communities, not just saying CBPR, but actually working with communities and having them involved in the research. Not always possible, I know, but in cases where it is, it works really well. Um, work on building those partnerships prior to the event. I think the time I spent between 2009 and the event made a big difference because they reached back out to me really quickly and said, hey, can you come out here and talk to us? We need to know what's going on about um, some of the things that you know. Funding the local nonprofits, that really helped. The NSF grant allowed us to fund the local nonprofit and the shrimpers. We were able to pay captain's fees, pay for fuel. That made it a lot easier to go out rather than having to subsidize us on their backs because they weren't working and weren't making money at that time. Hire, lo hire local. Um, we were sort of seen as a group they wanted to work with when it came to surveys because they felt like they were going to get something from it. One of the big gripes they always have is people come out, study us, they disappear, and we don't have any idea what they ever found out about us. Um, and then giving the uh, communities part ownership over the data just real quick in terms of disseminating. They didn't want to disseminate anything. They felt like at the end of this study they had done what they needed to do and they didn't want to talk about it anymore. Okay. For the academics, we published three peer-reviewed articles, two in environmental health perspectives, which is the flagship journal for NIEHS. Um, published some with uh, collaborators at other, other universities, including Dr. Kane, who is next. Uh, we have a few others in the pipeline. Um, so for those of you worried about getting publications, uh, that's not the end all to be all, but I do know it's important for academics. We've also gotten two more grant awards using this data as preliminary data. And we produced two dissertations, at least in part. And then I'd like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for getting us started. Um, we've now got funding from the NIEHS that's winding down. Several of our masters of public health students have been involved in, in either their practicum or their culminating experience programs. We've got some other community partners who are helping us now. All the people that helped participate in the research. And then lastly, I'd like to thank Louisiana Sea Grant for bringing us over. And I have probably gone way over. <laughs> so, time for a question or two? Yep. Yes. Uh, so for the PAHs that we did detect, especially those lower molecular weight PAHs, the one that we typically pick up in our samples, whatever they are, whether they're shrimp or soil or you name it, are things like naphthalene. Um, and naphthalene is just a ubiquitous low molecular weight PAH that's found all over the place. Uh, there's also some concern in speaking with some of our analytical chemists that it, sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a background contaminant in the lab. The higher molecular weight PAHs aren't typically, but naphthalene is really problematic in that way. Um, suffice to say that even those levels of naphthalene were far below any that anybody would consider of, of a health risk or something. 